Well, we've gone from the king's speech to no speech. <laughs> <laughs> I want to know how you dealt with that. <laughs> um, the last two things have been very preoccupied by the voice. I mean, I, I've gone from mm. the King's speech, which is all about what failure of your voice means to an individual, to, to a film, which is all about people's voice operating at the highest possible level um, in, order to, uh, in order to do justice to the Les Miserables. So, um, uh, yeah, it's um, it's an interesting preoccupation. Yeah. <laughs> um, it it was just looked and felt and sounded magnificent, mm, and um, for a generation or more of theater lovers who have felt this musical, mm. breathed it, lived it, eaten it, consumed it in every way that they possibly mm. can, what made you feel like now this and in this way? Um, well, firstly, I, I, you know, I, I know that so many millions of people hold this musical very close to their heart and, and uh, are very protective of it, so I wanted to find a way of doing it that, that honoured what people love in it. Um, and, I, and I thought a lot about how it makes people feel and how it promises the opportunity to re-experience these strong emotions every time you go. So I wanted to make sure that when I translated to the big screen, it was... Um, uh, I would make the emotions even more intense um, that people are familiar w do about getting. Um, so, uh, but I, I, in, in terms of why now, I mean, partly because the actors currently exist to do it. I mean, I, I think if Hugh Jackman didn't exist, I'm not sure I would have made it now. You know, that combination of a brilliant singer, brilliant actor, who has the physical strength to play Valjean, uh, who's a film star, mm -hmm. who um, and has the, who has this sort of grace and moral compass to, 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 to convincingly portray Valjean's mm -hmm. spiritual journey. All, you know, these things all came together in Hugh and made it possible. But also the thematically, you know, I thought a lot about why now is it relevant, is Les Miserables relevant? And the truth is that around the world there are so many people really hurting because of social and economic you know, inequality mm -hmm. and inequity. Um, and we you know we've had protests on Wall Street in London, there's seismic shifts happening in the Middle East, and Les Miserables is the, the great anthem of the dispossessed, and it, and it suggests that we can all rise up and change our circumstances for the better. Uh, but that sense of collective action is rooted in compassion, it's rooted in, you know, in, in, in virtue and love and caring about the person closest to us. And mm -hmm. you know, I, th I thought there was something very timely about that particular story at this time. I love knowing that, that's, that's fantastic. I think the thing that is so captivating and fascinating for theater lovers in particular, and to everyone, but theater lovers in particular, is this whole notion of the live singing yes. component. Yeah. And I would love to pick your brain about that because I know it's something that you probably had to fight pretty hard for. Mm. And I'm just curious, was it always that was it always necessary for you? Did you ever consider doing it another way? No, I, n I never considered doing it to lip sync. I mean, it, I would go so far as to say that it, I, I would not do the film unless I could do it live. It's so Thank essential <laughs> it was to me. Because, you know, it was all about giving the power back to the actors. Um, mm -hmm. One of the most important things about acting is having freedom in time. Mm -hmm. If you're lip syncing to playback, you surrender that freedom in time and you have to match to the millisecond something you did three or four months before. Uh, you know, I, I, I knew that the greatest job for my cast was to create the illusion that they were inventing these songs as these characters, that they, they weren't doing renditions of famous right. songs. They were, they were cr creations in the heat of the moment. And to create that sense, you know, they might need to stop for a moment to, to allow an idea or emotion to form in the eyes mm -hmm. before they express it. If they get emotional, uh, they, they might need to um, stop completely or take that emotion through to the end of a phrase. Mm -hmm. uh, so I, I wanted them to have all the freedoms that they would have acting dialogue, but in song and, and, and treat um, singing with the same respect that you treat a dialogue scene. And I was convinced that in that you'd get a tremendous increase in the realism of the form, but also in the motion, in the emotions of the form. Yeah. Was it difficult to, because that's simply not done in this mm. way, was it difficult to build the case for that? Did you encounter resistance? I did encounter some um, resistance, but uh, you know, I felt that Cameron McIntosh was al always 
very excited by this and and um, and my producers were always very excited but the, you know, there were some tremendous technical challenges I mean one of the ways we achieved it is you know, everyone was wearing radio mics on the outside of their costume sometimes two mm-hmm. uh, and at the end of the film, once it was edited, we digitally removed all the microphones to replace them with the costume. And, and that, that's a technology that 10 years ago would have been unthinkable. And, and part of my awareness that it could be done live was to realize that technology has moved on and opened up some doors that weren't possible in the, in, in the, great, the great age of the musicals in the 60s. Uh, and that was exciting to, to, to apply the latest technology to our challenge. Mm-hmm. You know, we've spoken of the just breathtaking Hugh Jackman. I mean, mm-hmm. what he accomplishes in this role is is quite something to mm-hmm. behold. I think he's taken his art to a whole other level. Uh, the watching that that really mm-hmm. incredible journey of and painful journey of watching him inhabit Jean Valjean. What about the rest of your cast? Did you have um, your dream team um, of of the rest of them? I mean, everyone seems so perfectly. Put. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I, I'm so lucky and blessed with my cast. I mean, you know, uh, Amanda Seyfried brings um, a, a wonderful sort of fine intelligence and restive quality to Cosette, but also instinctively understood that she was a, a ray of light and a, and, a, and, and a source of, wa- you know, warmth in a tough story. And, mm-hmm. and she does that. She brings that light into the film so brilliantly, and her voice is the voice of an angel. Samantha Barks playing Eponine, it was so exciting to have um, a member of uh, the, the cast of the West End production and, and she beat out extraordinary tough opposition to hold her own in that role. Um, and the way she has learned to relearn how to perform that song, but in the language of the camera close-up mm-hmm. is extraordinary. Eddie Redmayne, I mean, who knew the man could sing like that? Empty Chairs and Empty Tables is a phenomenal piece of acting. It uh, is. I mean, it, you know, it blew my mind when I was shooting it. Uh, and I sat there thinking, my God, what, what are people in the audience going to feel? Um, uh, Russell Crowe, I mean, I, I didn't know he, he had a background in musical theatre. I mean, how lucky am I that, you know, one of the biggest film stars in the world who was such a perfect Chabert uh, had this background in musical theatre and has such passion for music and he was so excited to be involved. Um, and then, of course, you know, Anne Hathaway, uh, it was kind of everyone's muse on the film. She'd so sort of mastered the art of, mm. of, 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 of singing in this way that, of reinterpreting the singing for the, for the, for the cinematic close-up that mm-hmm. it was astonishing. Yeah. Well, Tom Hooper, we thank you for bringing <laughs> this beloved story to the screen in a, an entirely new way to thank see you. it, and it's really appreciated. Thank you so much.